Happy Easter, everyone. Well, uh, I have been down there, and I've smelled the smells, and I've seen the decorations, and if you have not had breakfast yet, don't miss out. It looks like it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful time down there. Well, one day uh, this week, earlier this week, I uh, moved from the treadmill of the winter to the uh, outdoor walk, and uh, it had rained in the evening, and and uh, so the pavement was wet, and as I went out on my walk, there were all the worms. <laughs> I tried to avoid them at first, and then I kind of gave up. And I said, ah, just enjoy the walk. It's only a worm. Well, I think I killed quite a few of them, but uh, let's not go there this morning. But now I want to take quite a leap. We're going to go from talking about worms to theology, okay? Theology, the study of God. That's what it is. That's all it is. And there are all types of theology. There's a biblical theology. There's systematic theology. There's dogmatic theology. I found out recently that has nothing to do with uh, Fido, who lives in your backyard. And then there is this interesting theology called worm theology. Now it's all coming together, right? The idea behind worm theology seems to be that only by continually degrading of ourselves are we able to truly grasp God's love and mercy towards us. Churches taken with this theology think it their job to induce guilt and to induce shame on people. They work hard to get people to a state of remorse and self-revulsion so that they're compelled to stay on the straight and narrow and remain humble even after putting their faith in Jesus. Worm theologians continue to harp on how evil and how wretched followers of Jesus, children of God, still are. Well, I am pleased to announce that here at River Valley, this Easter Sunday, that Easter debunks and flies completely in the face of worm theology. You see, Jesus did die for our worminess, but that is not where the story ends. The story ends with worms turning into beautiful, beautiful butterflies. The story ends, as we will see this morning, that those who die with Jesus are also raised from the dead with Jesus, not just at some future time, but right now. Christ is risen. Would you pray with me? Father. Oh, we are filled with joy this morning. Lord, we are filled with joy because you have made us, who have put our faith in you, into people who are beautiful, people who have your spirit living within us. Lord, help us to remember that. Help us to realize what that means for each of us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you... Uh, Need a Bible? I'd love for you to have one to look at. Raise your hand. Our ushers will share one with you. If you do not have a Bible in your home, please uh, take this one with you. It is our gift to you. But we're going to turn to our text for today. It's Romans chapter 6, and we're going to begin at verse 5. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. Paul writes, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing 
so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Well, the last time I checked, worms didn't know that they are dead to sin and alive to God. Come to think of it, the last time I checked, worms didn't know if they were dead or alive. In fact, I'm told they have the smallest brain of all the organisms on this planet. Now, I promise, I'm going to get off the worm topic in just a little minute here. Bear with me. I can imagine the conversations that are going to go on around your Easter gatherings today. Well, what did your pastor talk about? Well, what did your pastor talk about? Well, our pastor at River Valley was stuck on and obsessed with worms. Well, okay, listen so you can t see why I am obsessed with worms today. The basis, one, one, more, one more little thing to worms here, okay? The basis for worm theology comes from Psalm 22. It is biblical. I hope you're going to read this psalm in the near future because it is a beautiful picture that was written centuries before Jesus' death on the cross, but it predicts it beautifully. The, this, this prophetic psalm points to Jesus' death, and in it, David includes the line, I am a worm and no man. This is the line that points out how despised and rejected Jesus was by the people of his day. <laughs> These words, I am very glad to say, have nothing to do with who we are in Christ. Tradition says that Jesus recited this entire psalm on the cross as he was dying, concluding with the words, it is finished. Well, from the praise-filled pleas of Hosanna last Sunday, Palm Sunday, to the blackness of Friday, Good Friday, to the outright celebration that we're having today. Some might be asking, what's, what's this all about? How have we gotten to this point? Well, as a kid, whenever I couldn't find something, who did I run to? I ran to mom, because mom knows where everything is, right? And I'd say, mom, where is what? Whatever. And her response was always, well, David, have you retraced your steps? If you do, you'll find what you're looking for. And shoot, she was always right. So let's retrace our steps this morning and see how we got to this point with Jesus. At the same time, I want to see how we've gotten to this point of Paul saying, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So our retracing our steps begins with Friday as we look at this idea of being co-crucified with Jesus. Now, let's talk about this pre prefix co here for a moment. We don't find this term co-crucified in the Bible. It's not there. But we do find the equivalent prefix sun in our text for today. It means union. But we got to think about it as not just near, it's way closer than among, and it implies complete unification with another. Complete unification. So what does it mean that we are completely unified with Jesus in his crucifixion? It means that we are crucified on that very same cross with 
Jesus. And what happens at that point? Our old nature dies with him on that cross. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To really, uh, really think and identify with this idea of being crucified with Jesus, we need to see the image of the very same nail that went through Jesus' hand going through our hand into the wood of the cross. First one hand, then the other, then our feet crucified with him, co-crucified. You say, I thought this was Easter. Why are we going back to Friday? We can't get to Easter if we don't know where we've been until we retrace our steps. Why does this crucifixion, this cold crucifixion need to happen? It's because of this. It's because of this black heart. It's black on purpose. This is the heart that we are born with. We got this heart from Adam and Eve because of their sin in the garden. That heart, that heart, it's a spiritual heart, and it is dead, dead as a doornail. It's lifeless, and it's full of worms. It's a sin-infested heart. The sin-infested heart needs to be removed. It needs to be removed by the surgery that happens when we are crucified with Jesus. See, crucifixion is a death of surrender and a, uh, and a death of submission. When Jesus was crucified, he surrendered his will. He submitted to the will of the Father for him. We too must surrender our will. We must submit to God's will. That means laying aside our selfish tendencies. It means surrendering our wants and trusting that what God wants for us is better than anything we could imagine. Romans 6 says this from our text. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Don't miss that word free. It puts the emphasis on what Jesus has done for us. It doesn't put the emphasis on what we do for God. Too often this, this, this quotation from the Bible, I have been crucified and it is Christ who lives in me, becomes a different way of putting it. It becomes wrong. It's, it becomes, I need to crucify myself. I need to try harder to make sure that God still keeps living in me. You see, when our focus is to try to deserve his presence, that's when we slip out of grace when we slip out of undeserved love, when we slip out of undeserved favor and we slip back into law living, it minimizes the power of Christ's death for us. We are relying less on the, our own power. We are less, no, I'm sorry. We are relying less upon the power of Christ and we're relying more on our power. And that will never, never work out very well. This idea of cold crucifixion, it's a tough one. It's something that will challenge us more and more as we go through our life with Jesus. It's because while our sinful nature, our old sinful nature is gone, it's dead, 
Sin is still available to us. Messing up is still available to us. Doing what God doesn't want for us is still available to us. And we know that sin can be very enticing. Sin uses everything to tempt us, from arguments to explanations to excuses to blame. But the Bible tells us that as we are co-crucified with Jesus, we die to sin. We die to the selfishness of sin, and we die to the enslavement of sin. Now, maybe you haven't been with us for the past several months, but, but if you're struggling with sin in your life, next Sunday we resume our study of the book of Romans. And that's going to give you some good insight, not good insight, great insight into the struggle with sin. Now, this whole idea of co-crucifixion, we don't really want to go there, and we especially don't want to go there on, on Easter Sunday. But there is no greater liberation than co-crucifixion with Jesus. You see, if we go through crucifixion, if we go through death with Jesus, we also each have our own Easter as we are co-resurrected with him. Just like we are completely unified with Jesus in his death, so too we are completely unified with Jesus in his resurrection. Look at that text again. In verse 8, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Did you know that Jesus' resurrection marks the first time in history that someone rose from the dead? Never to die again. Jesus didn't die again. Jesus' resurrection was a true and total defeat of death. He overcame it once and for all. The Bible proclaims loudly and clearly God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And after his resurrection, Jesus said, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Keys, I've always had a big wad of keys my whole life long. First as a teacher, I had a, I mean, it bulged out to here. Now as a pastor, I got keys. They bulge out to here. Supposedly, the keys mean authority. I don't know that I have any authority. But keys represent authority. Jesus says, I've got the keys of death. I've got the authority. I've got the supreme power over death. Jesus' conquest of death is permanent. Take it to the bank. The good news of the gospel is grounded in Christ's victory over death. Without the resurrection, there is no good news. There is no gospel. Without the resurrection, there is no hope for any of us. The fact that Jesus has conquered death solves the greatest problem you and I will ever face. But that's only half of it. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Now, let's pump the brakes here for a minute. I thought that the resurrection was all about new life after we die. What's this whole thing about being dead in our sins right now? I thought the resurrection was just about life later on. No, that's why the Bible says this, but God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. There it is again. There's our Greek word of the day. Sun. Alive together. Co-resurrected. We are completely unified with Jesus in his resurrection. Right now, not after we, just after we take our final breath. Right now. What does that mean for us? Well, let's go back to our friend here. Remember him? The one with the dead, sin-infested, worm-filled heart. Get your ready. When we place our faith in Jesus, we are co-crucified, co-resurrected, and that old black heart is replaced with a clean heart, an alive heart, a new spirit, one that is completely worm-free. This means our life immediately takes on new qualities. Jesus calls it abundant life. This abundant life is where we are resurrected at the moment we place our faith in Jesus. At that moment, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in that clean, pure heart, and we become fruit producers. Didn't you all have it in your to-do list to become a fruit producer? I hope so. Because no longer are we avoiding this stuff over here. No longer are we forcing ourselves to do this stuff over here. Fruit, good fruit, it's just popping out of us. Have you ever tried, said, I'm going to get an apple out of this arm. I'm just, I'm just going to work really hard. Come on, apple. It doesn't work. It's impossible. But when we are resurrected with Jesus, the Holy Spirit immediately begins producing good things from us. It's not something we work on producing. It's not something we have to concentrate really hard to make sure it happens. It just miraculously happens. There's one more thing. One more thing that we must not forget when we are, cro we are cro co crucified with Jesus, we are co resurrected with Jesus, and we are co ascended, we are co seated with Jesus. Do you know that 40 days from now we, we can celebrate the ascension of Jesus? You know, he rose from the dead, he was with, on the earth for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven. Forty days after that, Jesus ascended, and what happened next? He sat down. He was seated. Take a look at how uh, Paul finishes this passage from Ephesians 2. But God, being great in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There it is again. Son, completely unified. At the moment we place our faith in Jesus, we are completely unified with him. Spiritually, we've died to sin. Spiritually, we've been raised to new life. Spiritually, we ascend with him. We are no longer part of this world. But we have been lifted up to a heavenly perspective on life because of this co-ascension. And from this vantage point, we gain two very important new perspectives on life. 
We are seated with Jesus. Why is it important for us to be seated? Well, in the Old Testament, the priest, the, the person responsible for offering those sacrifices over and over again that earn forgiveness, that person, <laughs> there wasn't even in a chair in the, in the sanctuary. There was no chair to offer him because he would never have even thought of sitting down. His job was so important because he needed to co continually offer these sacrifices to gain God's approval so that the people could have access to him. That's why it is so important for us to see Jesus sitting down. After his death on the cross, no more sacrifices were required. It was done. His sacrifice on the cross was enough. The last one would ever be needed. It doesn't need to happen ever again. That's why he said from the cross, it is finished. All we have to do, all we have to do is put our faith and trust in that sacrifice. We must see ourselves as seated with Jesus. But I admit, for me, that's a bit problematic. Because even though we are people who have been made perfect through Jesus' final sacrifice, sin is still out there. Sin is still an option for us. But when we get involved in it, it's no longer compatible with that new heart. And we are miserable. We know that when we participate in sin, we are miserable. We know that sin is not good for us and there are earthly consequences. So yes, we are to avoid it and we are to avoid it like the plague. But unfortunately, we'll be giving into it until we take our final breath. But what the good news is, is that we don't have to re-earn the forgiveness that Jesus earned for us. We no longer have to make ourselves deserving of being in God's presence. He achieved forgiveness for us. So we get to sit down. And boy, the older I get, the more I like to sit rather than stand. We get to sit down knowing the beneficiaries that we are beneficiaries of Jesus' work. And when we're seated comfortably next to someone, what, what just naturally happens next? We get to talk to that person whenever we want to. We have direct access to God himself. You see, our spiritual seat, when we ascend with Jesus, we're, 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 we've got a seat at the presidential VIP table where we actually have been given the unbelievable privilege of being seated with the son, get it, capital S, son of the president, and next to the president himself, that gives us direct access to the creator of the universe. And you know what's even better? We can look at the creator of the universe as our dad. The best dad there ever was or ever will be. Gives us direct access to him, to talk to him, to pour out our hearts to him, to thank him and to praise him for what he's done for us and to just know that he's with us every moment of every day. So two questions as we wrap it up here. First question. Every one of us need to answer this question. Have you, have you in faith been co 
crucified, co-resurrected, co-ascended and seated with Jesus. <laughs> if not, my question is, why not? Why not? See, it happens by making a very simple statement. We try to come, we try to make it way more complicated. It happens by simply saying, Lord Jesus, I place my faith and trust in you for salvation. Or, as the thief on the cross next to Jesus said, Lord, remember me when we come into your kingdom. Second question, and I think this is probably for most of the people in this room. If you have placed your faith in Jeezy, Je Jeezy, <laughs> that's the familiar name for Jesus, are you just looking at it as fire insurance? You know what that is? Kind of turn or burn? Believe in Jesus so you don't go to hell? No, that's a very important part of the gospel. But what thrills this pastor's heart is that here at River Valley, more and more people are not only getting that all-important fire insurance, they are finding out that there's so much more. They're figuring out their identity by seeing who God makes them to be. They are seeing who God makes them to be when they put their faith in Jesus. They're seeing who God makes them to be when they are co-crucified, co-resurrected, co-ascended and seated. They're finding out that this benefit begins right now, not just when they die. You see, when we truly know who we are, when we truly realize that we have died with Jesus, when we realize that we have been raised with Jesus, that's when eternal life really begins. For Christians, eternal life is now. Jesus says this eternal life is abundant life. Life where forgiveness is not only guaranteed, it's a done deal. Life that is lived from this new heart that has been placed within us. Living life that avoids sin because living in sin is not compatible with this new heart. This life, please, this life is not a checklist of to-dos. I must do this. I must do that. This, this life is not a list of following the rules. Don't do this. You better not do that. This life is dominated by freedom. Freedom from the power of sin and freedom to live in cooperation with our new, righteous, perfect standing that is ours when we are in Christ. This life, this life that is ours, it's filled with fruit, love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Does anybody have any problems with anything on that list? That is what the new life is filled with. That is what that new heart is all about. We're not only filled with this stuff, we produce this stuff. My dear friends, that is not, by any stretch of the imagination, worm theology. That is Jesus' theology. 
He is the one who did it. He is the one who does it. And he is the one who will continue doing it for all of eternity. Christ is risen. Let's pray together. Father, we are filled with wow this morning. Wow that you have offered us who were once worms. You have made us into beautiful butterflies by simply having us put our faith in you. Lord, what a privilege, what a blessing. Lord, we want to live like butterflies. We want to live for you. It's an easy life. It's an abundant life because we are living in cooperation with who you have made us to be. It's only when, it's only when we try to live contrary to that. That's when life is difficult. So Lord, in the days ahead, would you remind us who we are? Remind us that we are indeed your children, your kids, you're our dad. You love us. And that should make all the difference. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.